brother. We are going to read some scripture right off the top. We've been asking God to speak to us in this season of endings. You guys, are, oh yeah, stay standing, stay standing. Um, we've been asking God to speak to us in this season of endings by looking at the endings of the Gospels. Um, and he's been speaking clearly. And I just, plain and simple, want to read the last few paragraphs of the Gospel of John to us. And again, we stand because we're eager to receive. <laughs> we stand as a sign of reverence and we stand as a symbol saying, God, you can, you can trust us with truth. We're willing to carry it from this place with our two feet. Uh, first, I just ask you to pause. If you feel comfortable, just close your eyes and man, just take a breath. God is already speaking through the words that we've sung together. He is a God that wants to be known which means that he's a God that's eager to speak. And my friends, there are different ways he speaks to us, but he speaks most powerfully, most consistently uh, through his word. And so I just, I invite you to pray simple prayers that God speak to me. I invite you to pray a simple prayer that simply, Holy Spirit, come and illuminate the word of God. Shine a light on it. Give me ears to hear it and a heart to receive it because I can't shake the feeling that I might not be the same if that takes place. Breakaway, this is the word of God for you tonight. This is John chapter 21. It says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. They didn't recognize him. They didn't truly see him. Jesus said to them, children, in the original language, it's actually a little boys. Do you have any fish? They answered him, no, with that inflection, in my opinion. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciple came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal, charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he'd been raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said this the third time. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had also leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it? that is going to betray you. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about this man? Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remains until I come, what's that to you? 
you follow me. So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it then to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, last sentence in the Gospel of John. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Breakaway. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Everybody said together, amen. Now, take a seat. <laughs> Perhaps one of the most remarkable things about the last chapter of John, and we did just read an entire chapter of the Bible again, two weeks in a row, something I will never apologize for. One of the most spectacular things about the last chapter of John is simply this. In my opinion, it's just that it exists at all. The fact that John chapter 21 exists at all is a bit confusing if you read John chapter 20. Because John chapter 20 followed the formula the other, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke put forward when it comes to how to end a gospel. You've got good material to work with, with the resurrection itself. Just mention the fact that Jesus is alive again. Give the details you feel compelled to emphasize. Close it up, and then let's move on. And it appears that that is what John is going to do at the end of his gospel. If you look at John chapter 20, there's a resurrection account, very similar to the ones we've already studied in this space on Tuesday nights. He adds a couple sweet moments between the resurrected Jesus and Mary Magdalene, where he reveals himself. He asks her why she's crying. Uh, She gets confused, wondering if he's the gardener or the one who's stolen Jesus's body. And then this beautiful moment happens where he just says her name, Mary. And she has this moment like, only one person says my name like that. And she says, Jesus, it's you. This beautiful moment of recognition. And it says that she goes and she tells the disciples, he called my name and here's what he said. And my friends, that might be all you need to have a faithful testimony as you leave this place. He called my name and here's what he said. Now, after that initial resurrection account, there's two post-resurrection appearances that John feels fit to attach. One of them, the disciples are terrified post-cross, and they're terrified of the Jewish leaders coming and finding them and probably putting them on a cross of their own for association with the rebel. And it says that they are locked in a room and that Jesus disregards all that security and just appears in the midst of them. This powerful moment of confirmation, he is alive. I pray that you were in some church somewhere on Sunday, glorying afresh in the incredible news that Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. It's, it's a good thing to be reminded of. It was true on Sunday. It's still true 48 hours later. Now, one person was not present in that first appearance, according to John. It's a disciple named Thomas. I don't know what Thomas's plans were, but wow, he blew that one, right? Should have been there. And so Thomas hears what happens from the other disciples that are there, from the other remaining 10, because uh, you know, Judas has removed himself from the picture at this point. And his response to hearing that he was the one left out is really interesting. Thomas, he, he kind of sounds angry. He says, here's the deal. Unless I see him with my eyes and unless I touch the scars in his hand and put my hand into his side where the spear was, unless that happens, I will not believe. It's kind of audacious, ain't it? Like he's calling the shots and making demands of the Jesus who's not in the room that he's in at that moment that has him all salty about it. And here's what's incredible. Jesus honors the request. And the next appears, like Thomas is in the room with everybody else and and Jesus shows up again. It seems just for Thomas, just to give this man in the midst of his doubt, who's like throwing down ultimatums attached to it, 
He shows up. He doesn't scold him. He doesn't put him in his place for having doubts and for expressing them through anger, it seems. Instead, he sees fit to come close. And I'm not saying this is a prescription in the Bible. It's not a how-to of how to approach God in humility. That's certainly not. But if that's all you've got tonight, as you try to figure out if Jesus is real or not, he'll take that prayer from you. Like I challenge you, if that's just where you are in this season, like I'll believe when he shows up, when bah, like you call your shot. I don't know that it's going to work, but I got a story that says it might. And the fact that he's brought you here tonight through whatever means he's brought you here is, is an indicator that he might be angling hard towards revealing himself to you in a fresh way. So there's these two incredible resurrection appearances. Now here's the interesting thing. There's a seemingly perfect ending uh, at the end of chapter 20 that seems just as poetic as the one we just read at the end of the book itself. It says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. And it just feels like it's supposed to say, this concludes the gospel of, Je oh, but wait a minute, there's more. That's where chapter 21 comes from, which we just read in its entirety. And a really interesting question is, why? Why chapter 21? You just followed the formula in chapter 20. You just shared the most important news you could ever share. Jesus is alive. He has paid the debt that we needed paid for our sins on the cross. He has risen to new life so we can have new life if our faith is in him. It's been confirmed several times over, not just by eyes that can see, but by hands who could touch. This was no ghost. This was no illusion. This was no shared you know, hallucination. You've done that. Why chapter 21? And I think that a better question than why would John tack on a few more paragraphs? A better question would be for whom would he tack on a few more paragraphs? And the answer is for Peter. Perhaps more accurately, for people who can relate to Peter and all of us should be able to in one way or another. If you aren't familiar with the story of Peter, you need to be. Because man, his story can come alongside us in the moments of our big mistakes, in the moments of I cannot believe I did that, in the moments of I cannot believe I did that again, in the moments of surely I have disqualified myself from being close to God or representing him or being sent by him. Peter's story comes alongside us in those moments. Because although John name checks Peter 32 times in his gospel. He knows there's something so meaningful about Peter's story that he weaves it throughout the entire gospel account that he writes. And it, you know, at the beginning, Peter has this beautiful story being called to Jesus in chapter one. This is the simple call, come follow me. He shows up again in chapter six. Jesus teaches this hard teaching that you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you wish to follow me. They think he's recommending cannibalism. He's foretelling the cross and the Lord's Supper and communion. But it says many disciples turn back. They're like, we're not following this weirdo anymore. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, are you going to leave too? And he just says, Lord, where am I going to go? You alone have the words of life, this beautiful thing about Peter's character, his desire to be faithful. He gets featured again in chapter 13. Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples on the last night of his life. He comes to Peter and Peter, because he exalts Jesus to the degree that he understands and says, you can't wash my feet. I'm supposed to be washing your feet. And Jesus says, Peter, if you don't let me wash you, you have no part in me. And then Peter says, then wash all of me, Lord. Like he has this all in zealous personality that's beautiful, that's pleasing to God. This, I want all of it. But then we get to chapter 18, the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is about to be arrested. Peter's right there next to him. And either in his fear or in his, or, and, or in his commitment to his rabbi, he pulls out a sword and takes off a dude's ear. Who's trying to arrest his Jesus. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Homeboy was not going for the ear. That's not really a thing. Like, I'm going to take off his ear. That'll show him I mean business. You know, like, he's like trying to do damage. Like, 
Zeal is not a problem for Peter, but sometimes it seems that his zeal gets misdirected, flares up in the wrong ways. After that, he follows from a distance as Jesus is arrested from a distance, and then he three times denies even knowing his Jesus. Sometimes confronted by people with a measure of authority, but one of them when confronted by a servant girl around a campfire. The zeal of Peter's faith quickly turns into denial that he even knows him. Anybody feel like they can relate with Peter a little bit? Anybody feel like they can go from declaring Jesus with their words to denying Jesus with their actions in about 45 minutes or so? I can. I can relate to that. His story jumps off the page. And when you get to chapter 20 and you get through these resurrection appearances, yes, Peter is in the room for those moments. But in those moments, he's having to settle for a measure of distance from Jesus, even if it's only a couple feet, and he's having to settle for a crowd. He's having to settle for an audience. So chapter 20, this seemingly perfect ending to the Gospel of John, actually lives, leaves Peter in the midst of his shame and his fear. And he's been so central, not just to the story of John, but to the heart of Christ. He's been one of the inner three disciples John refuses to leave him that way in his book because Jesus refused to leave him that way in his life. And I believe some of you might feel like the estranged Peter tonight as you come into this place. You might come in not able to articulate it, but because of your shame, because of your perceived failure, because of whatever it is you've been through, man, you on the deep level, perhaps a level you've been denying, are so desperate for an up-close encounter with Jesus where you can just say your peace and hear him say his peace and step into a new beginning and recognize the end of that season of shame. What a glorious new beginning that might be. So here's what we're going to do in record time. This is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to break every rule I've ever been taught in any preaching environment ever. You ready for this? It's going to be wonderful. Okay. Instead of giving you one thought (laughs) Instead of giving you a one-point sermon, or instead of giving you a neat, tidy, like Western, American, like three points in a conclusion sermon, I'm going to give you nine answers to the following question. What does Jesus say at the end to Peter and people like Peter? People like you and me. Pace will be crucial. My wife is on the front row, just like interceding on my behalf. Like, Lord, he can't do this. He can't do nine things in like any any amount of time. And we need her to be wrong, y'all. That's basically what we need. Uh, But we're going to walk through the text. We're going to let the text speak for itself. I'm going to move at breakneck speed. It's a great night to be a note taker. Um, And at the end, what we're going to do, at the end, I'll quickly recap the, the points, the things Jesus says to people like Peter at the end. And I'm going to leave space for the Holy Spirit to highlight the one that's supposed to stick to your heart. I'm going to trust the book. I'm going to trust the Spirit. And I believe it's going to be helpful. And we'll respond together. But let's take this walk and see what happens. So moving quickly, just reading the text, letting it talk for itself. John 21. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. Revealed himself in this way. Peter and his boys go go, uh, fishing. They say they'll come with And they go out into the boat all night, catch nothing. Right away. First thing, number one. At some point, you will be tempted to revert back to your before Jesus reality. Don't. Don't. Now, Peter had been told, like the other disciples, to go to Galilee and to prepare to meet with Jesus in the other Gospels. John doesn't mention that. But the other Gospels do. But what we see Peter doing is... The behavior looks like, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do the thing that I used to do before Jesus rudely interrupted my entire life. And that sounds really familiar to some of y'all, doesn't it? Really familiar. You will be tempted at some point. When things get hard, when doubt gets big, I'm going back. I'm going back to the scene that I used to use to define me. I'm going back to the behaviors that I used to use to medicate. I'm going back to the things that used to distract me. I'm going to find a way to do it. Please don't do that. 
Please don't do that. Attempting to go back to your old life after encountering the risen Jesus will ultimately prove unfulfilling and unfruitful, just like an empty net at the end of a night of fishing. You must resist the temptation to go back. It will not be fruitful. And here in this text, after grinding all night, their efforts are fruitless. Keep cruising with me. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the other side of the boat, on the right side, and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Clarity, this is a miracle, not a coincidence. It is not that the fish have been just huddling on the other side of the boat. Jesus had a good perspective in that dim, you know, morning light and said, actually, guys, I can see them. They're over here. This is absolutely a miraculous catch. 100% a miracle. And it illuminates the second thing you need to hear God say to you. The nearness of Jesus changes everything, changes absolutely everything in every way. In trying to go back to your old life, guys, how's that working out for you? But what if I come close to you and bless your efforts? What might that change? Now, listen, I'm not saying in some kind of prosperity gospel way that following Jesus will make everything in your life great. will make you run faster, jump higher, earn more money. There are biblical principles that can be very helpful to you, but there are no guarantees everything turns out peachy when you follow Jesus. Often there are promises to the contrary, but it is still a biblical principle that Jesus is often in the habit of blessing formerly fruitless efforts with his presence. Things that you tried before out of your own effort, if you invite Jesus close, those efforts to walk with him, those efforts to serve other people, those efforts to grow in ways you can't grow on your own, might just get wildly fruitful. Consider that. Is that the one you need to to think on this evening? Verse seven, that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, this is John, it's the Lord. John has the ability after obeying, after trusting and obeying Jesus's instructions, which make no sense in the eyes of the world, which make no sense in the ears of, of a professional fisherman, they still obey. They throw the nets, and after having the faith to trust and obey, then they see Jesus for who he is. What a principle. What a principle. Have you had enough faith to actually trust and obey the things you know God has put in your heart because the way you want to see Jesus and experience his nearness might be on the other side of that obedience you've been putting off? Okay? That call means a lot, but here's what I love. Uh, (laughs) he threw himself in the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. Number three, maybe my favorite. When hope shows up, dive in. (laughs) When hope shows up, dive in. When you recognize that you're in the midst of a holy moment, when you recognize you're in the arena because a sovereign God brought you here, not just because the cute girl invited you, right? When you recognize yourself in the midst of a holy moment where the God of the universe is drawing near to you and revealing himself in some way, just dive in. Disregard what is considered typical or sophisticated or normal and just do like Peter does here. He puts on his jacket, dives in, and swims to shore. He cannot be bothered with the process of pulling in the fish. And he knows, like, if I leave these jokers here to wrangle these 153 fish, I get my moment. I get my moment. Go get your moment. If you notice you're in the midst of a holy moment, then go get the moment you feel like you've been needing. He is waiting. He is waiting for you. Go get your moment. When hope shows up, dive in. Please, whatever it takes, do not settle for distance. I see Jesus over on the shore. And do not settle for an audience. I'm in the boat with these other people. Wonderful to encounter God in community like this. But he wants you. He wants you. He wants to meet with us. But he wants to meet with you and you. And you, and you, and you, etc. 
Don't settle for distance. Don't settle for an audience. When hope shows up, dive in. Verse nine, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Number four, the only thing you bring to the table that he wants is you. Notice that when they get to shore with this, this miraculous catch of fish, Jesus has a fire going. And what's on the fire? What's on the fire, people? Fish. fish. Did he need their fish? No. No, he didn't. The, the miraculous catch was not for Jesus. It was for them. It was a revealing mechanism. It was a reminder of where provision comes from mechanism. It was a reminder of where blessing comes from mechanism. When they get to the beach, he's already got it covered. He's already prepared breakfast. The only thing he wants that they bring to the table is them. The only thing that you bring to the table that Jesus wants is you, y'all. He's not after your stuff. He's certainly not after your joy. All he wants is you. He'll set a table for you. He'll, have, he'll set up breakfast for you. In my opinion, in our culture, breakfast is that meal you only have with somebody you actually want to be with. Right? You save the quick coffee for the people who are like, yeah, let's, you know, 20 minutes and we're out. Breakfast is an intimacy thing. Breakfast is, oh, I really want to spend time with you thing. Breakfast is, I have a plan for this relationship in a beautiful way kind of meal. And that's what he has waiting for them. And the only thing you bring to the table that he wants is you. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Number five, break bread with Jesus often. Break bread with Jesus often. Spend time with Jesus. That's what he says to you at the end of this semester, the end of this school year, the end of this season. Listen, I know you're worried about what it's going to look like. I know you're worried about all these different kinds of things. If you break bread with me every day, we'll figure out the rest as we go. Consistent time with Jesus covers such a multitude of hardships, y'all. Break bread with Jesus often because when you're certain you've disqualified yourself from that invitation to the table, he really wants to prove to you how wrong you are. Let him make you breakfast, that intimate meal. John 21 Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, he's going to ask him this question two more times in that passage, isn't he? He's going to ask him three times. Why is he doing that? Because Peter, cloaked in shame for denying Jesus three times, is going to be graciously offered by the one he abandoned three opportunities to rededicate himself. Three opportunities to hear parenthetical forgiveness and then hear a charge to care for the people of God that clearly assumes that he's been reinstated, that he's been restored in this beautiful, beautiful way. This passage is incredible. Number six, if you love the shepherd, you will care for his sheep. The threefold charge to Peter in that moment of restoration is feed my lambs, tend to my sheep, feed my lambs. If you love me, you will love them. If you love me, you will love them. And suddenly a call, not just to Peter, becomes a call to each of us who put our faith in Christ. That the story itself makes things very simple. That <laughs> this picture, this, this setting is basically saying, your job, y'all, is to catch fish and to tend sheep. To catch fish, to share the word. Call it evangelism, call it whatever you want, call it sharing the gospel, sharing your faith through relationship, inviting people into the family of God. I don't care what the words are you use, but your call, not just your job, but your joy is to catch fish and then to tend sheep, to help care for the other 
children of God, to find the way that you are gifted and equipped and positioned to care for the people that God cares about, to love the people that Jesus loves. If you love the shepherd, you will care for the sheep. Verse 18, home stretch. Truly, I say to you, when you were young, Peter, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Number seven, following Jesus will be costly. Follow anyway. Following Jesus will be costly. It will cost you a lot. It might just cost you everything. And the call is still to follow. Jesus basically says to Peter, hey, at some point you're going to get crucified just like me. At some point you're going to get crucified just like me. You're going to have nails driven through this most sensitive nerve centers on the human body. And you're going to have a horrible death like I did. And then he says, follow me. <laughs> follow me anyway. Because it's worth it. And, and, and it's good, Christian or not, to be confronted with how ridiculous that sounds. And to be forced to think, surely following Jesus, knowing Jesus, serving Jesus, being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing the things Jesus did must be wildly satisfying for that offer to make sense. And Holy Spirit, just make it true to the people in the room when I say this. Yes, that's right. That's right. It will be wildly costly, and it will be the most joyful, fulfilling thing you could ever do with the breath in your lungs. That's it. That's it. That's absolutely it. Follow anyway, catch fish, tend sheep, follow me no matter the cost. Then Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. So Peter turns and sees John, right? And uh, he's just heard, okay, I'm supposed to follow Jesus and I'm gonna get crucified for it. And he just looks around, he's like, uh, what about this dude? Can we do his, his next? Like, let's look at his future. What's going on with him? I'm in on that. And then John, Peter, said, Peter hears Jesus say about John, oh, if he wants to stay, if I have it for him to like never die and be around when I come back the second time, that's none of your business. And it clarifies that's not what he was saying, but he's saying, you know, Peter, uh, you need to be very aware of number eight. Stay in your lane, run your race. Stay in your lane, run your race. Young people, graduates, almost graduates, seniors, listen to me. A lot of the anxiety you feel right now about your future is because you're comparing yourself to classmates and people on your social media feed who don't know you, don't care about you, and you will likely never meet. Be released. Be released. Like, run your race. There is no better, more fulfilling place to be than square in the middle of God's will for you. And it will look nothing like other people's call. There will be distinctive things about it that are specifically what he has for you. Roosevelt used to say, comparison is the thief of all joy. So ask the Holy Spirit to help you stop to be set free from that. Run your lane. Stop obsessing over other people's calling, says Jesus. You follow me. You follow me. And guess what Peter does when he hears this? Exactly what he's told. The trajectory of the story of Peter is incredible. The leadership he brings to the early church, the faithful teaching and the faithful discipleship he brings to the people of God all the way up to and through the moment these words come true. When at some point people come, they're tired of his gospel proclamation and his supernaturally empowered life and his selfless love that still manifests joy, although it costs him much, they're tired of all of it. So they come 
They grab him. They carry him where he does not want to go. And they crucify him like his savior. But this is the thing. Because of the empowering Holy Spirit, because of his encounter with the resurrected Jesus, he is never the same again after breakfast on the beach with Jesus. And the one who is known for being wishy-washy at best from time to time, inconsistent, suddenly lives up to his name. Cephas, Peter, Petros, stone, rock, solid. He becomes very stone-like after breakfast on the beach with the resurrected Jesus and a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit. And when that crucifixion moment comes, he faces it with confidence, dare I say joy, and church history and tradition tells us Peter demands to be crucified upside down, almost to mock death and to make it clear I'm not even worthy to die like my Savior did. So crucify me upside down. Let's get on with it. Send me home. Unbelievable. This is the guy who used to sometimes declare and sometimes deny this Jesus. And there's nothing superhero about him, y'all. There's nothing superhero-like about him. If you relate to his inconsistency, if you relate to his perceived weakness, you must also, at least in a small way, relate to the possibility that a similar transformation could come into your life by trusting the word of God and being empowered by the spirit of God. But we're almost done. Last one, y'all. The real ending, now that Peter has gotten his moment, the real ending, verses 24 and 25. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Oh, you get poetry at the end. But not the flowery kind, like potent, powerful poetry. Number nine what God might be saying to you at the end of this season, anticipating the beginning of a new one, whatever it might look like, the last thing he might be saying to you, he's bigger than you think he is. No exceptions. God is bigger than you think he is. No exceptions. The love of God is bigger than you think it is. No exceptions. The transforming Holy Spirit of God is bigger than you think it is. No exceptions. The intricately woven story of God that you have a role in is bigger than you think it is. No exceptions. You have not exhausted the depths of God's truth. You've not exa exhausted the scope of his love for the world and his love for you in your Tuesday night time here, in your daily time in the word, in your faithful or sporadic Sunday service attendance. You've not come close. You have but scratched the surface of these things. And in this ending and in this coming season of transition, y'all, he's speaking that over you and he's inviting you deeper. Will you trust me more? Will you trust me more? As we go back to the beginning, will you trust me more? Will you trust me all over again? I've got, I'm just getting started. Don't believe the lie that this is the end. Not just that you've reached the end of my blessing or the end of the most fun season of your life or whatever it might be. Like, will you trust there's more of me to be had? Will you trust that we're just getting started? Will you trust me? I'm bigger than you think I am. Perhaps God says to you this evening. And there you have it. And there you have it. Would you, Holy Spirit, for every person in the room, would you just help us reflect on those nine things that we just walked through? And even as we just put them back on the screen, God, I just pray, would you bring these to mind? Like, oh, for those in the room who are tempted to go back to their before Jesus reality, would you just speak, don't do it? Would you just speak, come home? May those who need to hear that, hear it from you in this moment. 
May the truth that the nearness of Jesus changes everything. May that compel some to, to draw close to you all the more. May that truth stick to the hearts it needs to stick to. Gotta feel like this might be for people in the room. Like when hope shows up, dive in. Let that just be obvious that you are here. <laughs> And may those who have had hopelessness in their hearts feel you speak that to them in this moment through the word and through the spirit. God, I pray that the word that you spoke to us, that the only thing you bring to the table that you want, that we bring to the table that you want is you. (laughs) The only thing we bring to the table that you want is us. God, your your invitation to break bread with you often. The call to show our love for you, the shepherd, by caring for the sheep. The reminder that following you will be costly, but to follow anyway. The charge to stay in our lane, to run our race, nobody else's. And the beautiful reminder that you're bigger than we think you are, no exceptions. God, we just, we trust you. We trust the word of God, and now we ask you the spirit of God. In this time, in this space that you're creating for us, the same way you created that breakfast on the beach moment with Peter, you're creating a space and a time, a moment, an unhurried moment for us to hear from you. So speak. Speak and help us respond.